Psychologist Abraham Maslow said it best, and I'm paraphrasing. If your only tool is a hammer, you'll start treating everything like a nail. Maslow's words could explain part of the disconnect over policing today, namely the tools we put in officers' hands. This week in Oregon, state lawmakers advanced a bill that would ban law enforcement agencies from getting certain types of military surplus equipment. Those would include armored drones, grenades, and firearm silencers. I know, right? Grenades? You're probably not going to see those on the streets, but this secondhand military market beyond the grenades is nothing new. A federal program created in 1997 lets the Department of Defense give excess equipment to law enforcement agencies. The locals just pay for shipping. That initiative is known as the 1033 program. Often the supplies are pretty mundane, clothing, tools, radios, and so on, but departments can also get assault rifles and armored vehicles. And America has a lot of surplus weapons after our military operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, and elsewhere. Many people first learned of the 1033 program in the summer of 2014 in Ferguson, Missouri. You remember the protests after a white police officer, Darren Wilson, killed a black teenager named Michael Brown. Multiple police agencies responded to protesters with military-style gear like this. And that increased concerns over what many now call the militarization of police. Critics said many law enforcement agencies began to look more like armies. Around that time, the Blue Lives Matter movement gained momentum. Many police began identifying themselves as the thin blue line between order and chaos, good and bad. Oddly enough, many police agencies don't even wear blue anymore. Two decades ago, it would have been unusual to see local police officers in anything but blue pleated slacks. But today, many wear black or olive green utility uniforms, kind of like military uniforms. In fact, roughly 20% of law enforcement officers are veterans. Those include Derek Chauvin. He served the Army as a military police officer. Ask some officers and they'll describe themselves like sheepdogs protecting the flock from wolves. Some civilians prefer tougher sheepdogs. Others might say a friendlier watchdog would do. In pop culture and on the streets, some cops look less like Andy Griffith and more like the Punisher. And even the creator of that comic book character says police should stop using his imagery. So how much are police viewing their jobs militaristically? How do we get officers and citizens to view each other as neighbors rather than threats? Let's discuss it with NBC News terrorism analyst Jim Cavanaugh. He served more than three decades with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Jim, welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you, Joshua. Is there something that I and critics of this 1033 program are missing in terms of the value of military surplus in local law enforcement? Is there a good use case for why departments should seek access to this surplus? Well, you know, the devil's always in the details. It's mixed. I think overall, a lot of this military equipment is just not needed. Uh, you know, an MRAP, for example, a mine resistant armored pro uh, protected vehicle, MRAP they call it, which is resistant to mines. The police don't face mines. Those vehicles are so heavy to have that in your department and have to service that thing. Uh, the reason they take it is they get it for free and they don't have the, you know, 80 or $100,000 to buy a civilian uh, police armored vehicle. Now, there are civilian police armored vehicles, which is the, the real standard and what should be used and is not a military vehicle. Uh, the, those are built by the people who used to build Brinks trucks up in Massachusetts. Uh, they're called Bearcats or Bears. That's a common make. There's many makes. But there never were originally military vehicles. They often are painted dark color because, you know, they don't want to be shot at when they're in an operation. But, right. Uh, they don't. They don't have. You know. They weren't made with uh, any kind of giant uh, guns on them or anything. They were. Uh, you know. They grew from a Brinks vehicle. So, what happens in in policing, Joshua, is sometimes officers forget that image which you're talking about, which is so important, and they start looking like the military, and that distances yourself from the people you're supposed to protect and serve. So you need to kind of think about your image 
when you're putting on fatigues. Now, you know, it used to be we wore uniforms when I was a uniformed police officer. You know, our uniform was mostly a dress-looking uniform, you right, know, a right. starch shirt. And, tra- and, you know, you see police forces now. I mean, they wear in bloused boots. I'm talking about patrol officers wearing well, bloused boots and, and BDU-style uniforms for daily police work. And I'm not talking about special operations guys. You know, which maybe have to go out in the woods to do something, a uh, surveillance or a war or something. Well, I'm and talking also, about just a regular patrolman. You know. Well, that also probably feeds some of this image of the kind of sheepdog mentality among some law enforcement officers. And again, nobody wants law yeah. enforcement officers not to make it home to their families. Accepting that as read, the imagery in terms of that, it feels like, and we're also seeing this in terms of you know concerns about reforming law enforcement, dealing with white supremacy, extremism in the ranks that this creates an environment where that sort of mentality could, could, could take root, could find a hold in some officers who may have more extreme views, and the militaristic imagery might feed that for, for a few of the officers. Yes, and, and what you hit on is really the most important point. The, the militarization is a point that needs to be addressed and dampened down some, but by the same token, let me just add this point, Police need certain protective gear. They need a helmet so they can get hit in the head with bricks. They need those civilian-made armored bear cats. They need rifles because they're facing a nation awash in 400 million guns. You can legally buy a 50 caliber rifle that'll penetrate those armored vehicles today. And the Kalashnikovs and AR-15s that they face, uh, not only in mass shootings but in arrests and warrants, can kill multiple officers in half. Uh-huh. And we'll go right through their bulletproof vest, through them and out the back of their bulletproof vest. So we talk about one thing that we've got to think about when we talk about, well, the police don't need these things. Well, you know, they don't have them in England. Well, I've been to Scotland Yard. I've studied the gun crime there. I've worked on gun traffic cases with Scotland Yard. They don't have any guns over there like we do. They have an old Webley revolver and a blunderbuss. And the police don't need that many guns. They have special units with guns in London, for example. But they don't need that many guns. But the civilians aren't armed. You take, it's a big difference when you say, we got to be careful what the police have. Well, what does a civilian have yeah. that the police have to deal with every day? So we have to, we have to find the place where that is right. But the, the point you made that is so important to me, because I spent uh, 40 years chasing these Nazis and Klansmen and anti-government extremists, um, when they get in the ranks, they're just devastating, military or police. They hurt the country. They hurt the people, they hurt everybody. And what they try to do, and you saw it on January the 6th, they try to co-op the police. I was just thinking of January 6th, yeah. Yes, you were your buddies. See, we're carrying the blue line flag. Now, a lot of civilians don't understand that the thin blue line, the, the, the phrase the thin blue line is not new in policing. That goes back 50 years in policing, but it's inside baseball police talk. It's like an IED. We were calling bombs IEDs 40 years ago, but the civilian population didn't learn about that term until the latest wars in Afghanistan. We didn't have any reason to. We had no reason to even be to be cognizant. Before I have to let you go, uh, Jim, very briefly, before I have to to let you go, what would you what would you say to communities that say, you know what, I'm a law abiding citizen. These things are never going to roll down my street. I abide by the law. My neighbors abide by the law and I would rather they have it and not need it than need it and not have it on the day when it hits the fan. To folks who see it that way, what would you say to them very briefly before we go? Rethink it, save up the money from your city, join with another community or the county and spend the money to get their real civilian vehicle that's not so ominous, that's not so militaristic. Make sure your officer's not looking like the military, have the protective gear they need and the equipment they need, but make sure your tactics match what your mission is to protect everyone. Don't use, you know, military tactics with military equipment, which is going to turn off everybody and make them against you. NBC News terrorism analyst Jim Cavanaugh. Jim, thanks very much.